So when I say, how are y'all doing today? I want you to make so much noise that the people on the outside are like, man, what's going on over there? And they like gravitate in this direction. How are y'all doing today? Yeah, that's what I like to hear. Uh, my name is Fable, or Fable the Poet. I am Grand Rapids Poet Laureate. Uh, the reason that title makes my heart so happy is I'm the youngest person in city history to ever be named Poet Laureate. I'm also the first person of color in our city's history to ever be named Poet Laureate. Uh, so that makes me super, super happy. I am the executive director of the nonprofit, The Diatribe. We go around to different schools all across Michigan, uh, and we use spoken word poetry to help young people talk about the issues that they see in their community and that they see around them. We've also partnered with the Fair Housing Center of Grand Ra or West Michigan so that we can teach young people about gentrification, about redlining, about how where they live impacts their quality of education and getting people active and engaged in their community so that people don't take the property from under our feet. Uh, we have four dynamic poets that are here for us today. We're gonna go around kind of round robin style, talking about kind of like what world peace means to us, what peace means to us, what love means to us, and ways that we kind of try to implant these, these ideas in our everyday life and in our experiences. Do you all know what type of noises you can make if you like what you hear when you hear some poetry? You know what kind of noises you can make? One thing you can do is you can do some snapping. Can I have some snaps? Can I get some snaps, some snaps, some snaps? Some of y'all like, absolutely not. Some of y'all did, I appreciate you. Uh, you can also do some clapping. Can I have some clapping, some claps? Yeah, that always feels good. You can hoot, you can holler, you can whistle, you can, hey, anything that you wanna do that makes you feel good, you can do that if you like what you hear. Uh, I'm gonna call this first artist up. Uh, this human being is a dynamic, dynamic, dynamic local creative. She is also the host of Creston Vibes, which takes place every Tuesday at Creston Brewery. Everybody, please make some noise for one of the diatribe teaching artists. Put your hands together for Kid Kane. Give it up for Kid Kane, everybody. Um, kind of how I start everything, everywhere that I go, I'm intentionally uh, spreading peace and love everywhere. So we're going to do a little call and response. So when I say peace and love, if I can get, get you guys to shout back love and peace. Peace and love. Peace and love. Peace and love. We're going to try that again. It is World Peace Day. We are here to share peace and love. And so I need us to, you know, come from the belly area to share peace and love and to create a peace and loving vibration throughout this space. So let's try that one more time. Peace and love. Peace and love. Peace and love. All right, cool, cool, cool. Um, I know that through this art form, which is poetry, I have found a lot of peace. Um, it has changed my life uh, in so many ways. And in my reflection, um, as I create poetry, one of the things that I've noticed is that um, when you create pay peace within, it kind of vibrates into the atmosphere where your presence is, and then it magnifies. So if we find peace inside first, um, it opens us up to get to our goal of world peace, because we're so far away from it. Um, when, we, when we take the time to uh, see ourselves, it puts us in a position to see other people more clearly. And once you are at this balanced level of peace, um, you know, it's easier for us to create the world peace that we all want to see. So uh, this piece is called Color Consciousness. Allow these words to bring clarity to your hearts and ears. Allow thoughts of the color of love and truth to vibrate our frequencies into harmony until our heart chakras are clear. Let us put less focus on the colors that divide us and more focus on the colors that brings us all near. Let us give thanks. Let us give thanks to the universe and take notice to how she cares for us, the sheer magnificence of how she provides us with everything that we've ever needed, selfless, but our greed for green has us divided, made us selfish, almost unworthy of the love that she provides to us, but she continues to keep us alive. It's divine. I wonder if we took the time to channel the energy that she provides, if we can find it in our hearts and minds to love the same way she does. Seems we've got so lost in ourselves that we forgot about humanity, lost our humility. We're living in insanity, too, too far from serenity, peace, and love. Our people are sleeping in the streets. Our land is covered in blood. People are starving with no food or clean water to drink when 
The universe provides us with everything we've ever needed. I know it's time that we all rethink and take more moments to breathe deep and release. Breathe deep and release. Inhaling the colors of rose quartz and serenity blue, the color of love and the color of truth. Exhaling all of the negative energies and colors that divide us. I think it's time that we all rewind until we're able to find our divine selves because we cannot care for one another if we don't first learn to care for ourselves. Peace and love. Peace and love. Peace and love. I'm so, so, so happy that we are here today to celebrate World Peace Day. I am constantly setting the intention for peace, so I hope that we can all just take one moment, take a deep breath, and set more intentions for peace and love, all right? Thank you guys so much. All right, next up we got Rachel Gleason. Real clap for Rachel Gleason. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rachel Gleason. Um, I'm the director of education for the Daya Tribe, and it's been incredible to be a part of this organization since the beginning and see it grow the way that it has and be able to do events like this and meet you all here today. If you are interested in learning more about our organization, we do have a table over here. We have some brochures. You can sign up for our newsletter. We send out just one a month to let you know different events that we're doing and what we're doing in the community, um, including what's coming up November 23rd is the Grand Showcase Poetry Festival with headliner Rudy Francisco. You may have seen him on The Tonight Show. We also have Ebony Stewart and B. Capri featuring at that event and some amazing regional and local artists as well. Um, that's the next big thing we have going on, but we're always doing different events. Uh, you can find out more about what we do at this table. Grab a sticker, grab a pop socket, they're free. Um, but today I wanna to share a piece with you um, that for me is about what it means to be connected and to find the power within yourself. Um, I think that each of us have a lot of power within us to impact the world and sometimes that starts with yourself and then the people around you and then your community. Um, so this piece is about tearing down the walls that we often build up in ourselves so that we can connect with others and make an impact on this world. It's called The Other Side of Jericho. The human brain is a machine, a complex network. A starlit series of intricate compartments interconnected by superhighway synapses. My gray matter mechanism, fold upon fold of intellectual potential, flickering like the light of a lingering ghost, asserting its unrelenting presence. And there is a myth that we only use 10% of our full brain capacity, but that isn't true. And if you ask me, that's just an excuse for apathy, and maybe that's why everybody laughs at me because I use humor as a defense mechanism, because we all fall short, but at least I know my place in this organism. I know that life is chaos, it's ridiculous beauty. I know that mutation creates diversity, that consciousness is random, is fractal absurdity, and I want to laugh. I want to laugh like Sarah laughed when the angel told her that her 90-year-old womb bore life. I want to hobble with laughter until I weep in gratitude for my ability to be, to think, to analyze, to speak because my brain is a miracle machine and I am an inadequate vessel struggling to seize what has been laid before me. Endless possibilities because we all fall short and still I regret nothing. Not a single wasted moment because I chose it and all time is now, is future and is history, is constantly rising and setting. The hot sun burning my back as I wander, the hot sand burning the bottoms of my bare feet and I would wander through this desert for another 40 years as long as it brought me to my promise, as long as it brought me to my knees and back to my burning, bleeding feet on the other side of Jericho from my dream and I want to scream. I want to scream like Joshua screamed. I want to be red-faced and holy. I want to scream until my voice becomes a howl no human ear can hear. I want to scream until the walls I have built, unimaginably high, inconceivably thick, that mortar and brick begins to crumble and split by the force of my sound. I want to scream like Joshua screamed. I want to be that desperate and unleashed. I want to scream against everything that separates me from me. I want to scream until heaven has no choice but to answer because I want what was promised to me. I 
on to scream until the neck of synapses begin to crackle and finally to fire because human will is physical, is palpable, and anything is possible because mountains are made of the same grain as mustard seeds because the God in us can bury great cities under even greater seas because all time is now, is future, and is history, and we are all a part of this ridiculous reality and the breath in my lungs is the same cosmic wind that brought this world to be and it is finally time to awaken the god that sleeps in the deepest part of me thank you thank you very much next up coming up here i want you all to welcome jocelyn barnes give it up for jocelyn barnes hey friends um so First off, let's give it up for the nice weather we're having today. It's so nice out. So good. Um, so before I start, um, I want us to maybe all do a little um, call and response too. Um, so let's all you know, get kind of grounded, give thanks for the sun, and then I want everybody to say, I'm in touch with my community. I'm in touch with my community. Perfect. And I'm striving for peace every day. I'm striving for peace every day. Awesome. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I love Grand Rapids. Um, I used to go to school here um, and I am going to read something about um, acknowledging that peace isn't always where we're sitting. Um, so this is uh, about queerness and um, about acknowledging that in order for me to be able to be here and say, hey, I'm queer, um, took a lot, um, a lot of pain. and a lot of struggle. Um, so I'm going to read this. Um, yeah. Queerness is godly. To not have a name for the way that you love or exist, to not know any other way to love or exist, to know that this form of personal autonomy means giving up bodily security, means boots to bellies, means fighting for rights that should be inalienable, means disownment, means being victim without headline, means crime without justice. Taking the body, be it your lover's or your own, and calling it bread, calling it salvation. Looking into the mirror every day and declaring this is my body, it is broken for you, your blood, daring to be and offering the blood of your communion, an unholy offering, the blood of your congregation, the most unholy communion, spilt in the streets, drawn by those who wish you same, wish you complacent, wish you so still and unchanging. You can no longer move or breathe or dream. The hymnals found in the cries for justice you see. My gospel be stop police brutality be. We're here, we're queer, get used to it. Be turned into a riot in the streets of every city. The choir holding up signs and fists singing no pride for some of us without liberation for all of us, the ministry is brought to its knees time and again, and we are all hollowed in the knowledge that our bodies can be so consecrated. Needing a safe space to exist for the night, queerness finds peace and makes church within the confines of a local club, anointing itself in glitter, silk, and sequence, for there is no time to mourn. Instead, there is technicolor celebration on the dance floor, sanctifying through sweat, and working to the subliminal rhythm, finding that the best way to worship is equally the best way to love with the whole of you. All at once, a moving, grinding rapture. But I have to ask, what is there to do when even your church can be burned to the ground? This body is holy. Every mark on my flesh, a confession of the sins against me, of the way that my love be both prayer and answer, yes. 
My weight, my capacity to love is indeed divine, was gifted to me from on high. The only way that I know how to feel is overwhelming. A big and passionate mess of emotion and exaltation, I say small prayers, and between each kiss of my lover's skin, one. Grant me the resilience to remember that healing isn't linear, too. Let me find new ways to love you more each day. May I possess the grace for tenderness and the strength for vulnerability, three. Allow me the courage to express my boundaries, and four. Give me the patience and receptiveness to respect yours. Thank you. So next up, uh, you know, the poet laureate of Grand Rapids, um, my favorite person ever, uh, Marcel Fable, the poet. What up, what up, what up, what up, what up? So I appreciate everybody coming over who's snagging pop sockets, who's snagging these free CDs, who's snagging brochures, and who's signing up for our email list. Uh, a lot of people have been asking questions like, hey, can you tell me more? Like, are you guys just like poets? Like, I, I guess I don't get it. And that's fine, and I appreciate y'all asking questions. Uh, so the way our programming works is we do assemblies after school programs and workshops in roughly 20 schools a year all across Michigan. And what we do is we go into schools, we share stories about our upbringing, about our life, and then we read poems about it in full auditoriums of young people. So for example, with me, uh, I grew up uh, with a dynamic single mother who was like breaking her back to put pay less shoes on my feet and hand me down clothes on my back. Uh, I grew up with a really, really, really abusive stepdad who loved to drink and, and dive into hard drugs. And whenever he would, he'd always like put his hands on me, which made my upbringing feel just not very safe. I was that kid in school who always got suspended for fighting, whether it was fighting on playgrounds or basketball courts or movie theaters. I was that kid that couldn't be in school, couldn't stay in school and just didn't like to be in school. Um, so what we do is we'll share stories about our life, we'll read poems about it, and then we'll work with young people for six, nine, or 12 weeks getting their stories out. Uh, and at the very end, we get them working with organizations all across the city, sharing their stories, getting on these huge stages is a way to show people that like performing arts is valid, it's powerful, and that you can also use it as a beacon for healing. Uh, so if you do wanna come and learn more about our organization, please come over here, uh, snag some information and whatnot. Um, I'm gonna read a poem. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not a singer whatsoever and the beginning of this requires singing, and I don't know why I wrote it like that. It doesn't really make any sense. I don't, I don't know why I did that to myself. Um, but it's, it's based off uh, a song by Louis Armstrong, uh, and this poem is called What a Wonderful World, and it really uh, breaks down what peace means to me, especially world peace and the idea of it. Uh, so don't laugh too hard at my Louis Armstrong impression unless you want to, then laugh away, yeah. I hear babies crying, I watch them grow, they'll learn much more than I'll ever know, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. As the warm rays of the morning sun greet us through the withered ivory framed eyes of a Montessori classroom, the teacher plays gardener to a jazz band of vivacious adolescent seedlings in her middle school AP English class. As they tune their daily discretion, she plants them in a circle, interrupting teen gossip and statements of how terrible their lunch was with patience met with abidance. Once all of them are calm, ears ready, and voices prepared to chime over our sighs of relief that they are actually calmed down, we start off with an icebreaker. I want everyone to compliment the person to their left. Let's start with Sarah. The fuse was lit. Its wick burns through the first three young girls that sit beside each other every week with ease. A dynamic explosion of feminine emer energy that bounces off white square cork ceiling tiles, rattles window panes, and shakes the DIY mason jar candles and paper lanterns that make this room feel safer than everyone's childhood dream home. 
You can hear the roar of smiles and see sparks of authenticity cut through the shackles of competition that society forces on the ankles of these young women. These brilliant, vibrant, sharp humans destroying chains with molten statements of, girl, I love your energy. Another to Brie on her left. I love that you aren't scared to be you. Another to Shantae. You're the bravest person I know. And positivity flows through the classroom like the first rain in spring. Falling upon parched ears, we watch confidence bloom. Each smile, a new petal allowed to blossom, not plucked and discarded with an I love me, I love me not. Until the third girl gets to a boy and says, Victor, I love your smile. And you always got the flyest shoes. His face blossoming, a grand finale of reds and whites, teeth cheesing, oh cheeks a stoplight, praying she runs it. He says, girl, stop, but his smile says, proceed. But that boy turns to his left, and lo and behold, sees another boy. His grin fades, voice crackling in an off-key horn solo. He trumpets, bro, I'm not complimenting another guy, that's get his fist clenched so hard, his fingertips debated whether or not to breach through his palms. I don't like guys, I'm not. He pauses, looks around, lets out a reluctant, well, I've just never complimented one before. Time after time, week after week, when we would meet during these workshops, I'd feed them compliments until they were full, and then I'd feed them some more. Soul food every Thursday for lunch. Xavier, see you got a smile that will make a puppy blush. Ryan, you're so passionate, you make music listen to the sound of your voice. And Victor, thank you for always teaching me more than you'll ever know. So this cycle, at least in this class, would never again break because of a boy eager and willing to grow who was just never taught that he could be kind one lesson at a time. And I hope they think to themselves, what a wonderful world. Thank you. Everybody, one more time, I want you all to make some noise for Kid Kane. Put your hands together for Kid Kane, everybody. I think, oh, still on? Yeah. All right, I think the most important uh, part of my life is my relationship with peace and the ways that I've, I've, uh, I've used to find peace. And uh, for me as a child, it all started with reading and writing and creating the poetry that we are sharing, that I am sharing all over all the time. Um, as a child growing up in a space where uh, I didn't have acknowledgement from anyone, I was just kind of like background noise, um, it was very important for me to find ways to kind of self-soothe. And uh, through that, the desire to self-soothe, I found a level of peace that I didn't understand until I became an adult. Um, but this piece is called Plastic Creativity and it's about my journey to peace and creativity. I wrote classics. I wrote classics in classrooms when I was 10 years old. I got notebooks on notebooks of untold gold, a plethora of pages and writing utensils witness my life unfold. I chicken scratch my soul while eating ramen noodles and drinking ginger sodas back then. I knew my soul was old and no lie, I knew that I was timeless. I was not born, I will not die. I transcend the physical multi-dimensional when kid was a kid. She was ahead of her time, words ahead of the line, thinking of poems at the back of the line, rewriting my life in my mind. So I had a mom's like Claire Huxtable and a pops like Uncle Phil, living a life much more comfortable with less past due bills and more money to fill banks, less noodles and more steaks, less agitation and more vacations. I literally vacated the physical to live a life more traditional. These words raised me. These words saved me. These words gave me hugs when people forgot to hug me, gave me love when people were too busy to love me. These words have been my best friend. From writing stories to reading dictionaries in my grandmother's den, we've been click tight. So each and every day of my life, every day that I write, I use this creativity to remind me of wholeness.
using each word to fill the holes within me, using each poem to fill, using each poem to feel real. Real feelings feel the realest when I use these words. I use this creativity to calm my nerves and hop on stages like this one and learn about them new nerves, them something's brewing in my stomach's nerves. Knees knocking nerves, almost slurred my words, nerves. Then I use this confidence filled by my passion for creativity to not forget these words. And then the words that I almost slurred just seem to calm my nerves and I take flight. Yeah, I use this creativity to fly, to soar, carry your pigeon flow. Y'all know I use these words to send a message. Use this creativity to speak the truth. Use these words to open doors. It's a blessing. I use these words to teach life lessons. I use this creativity to spread love, to spread peace, peace and love. Damn, nobody remembers. Peace and love. Peace and love. Peace and love. Oh, you're my favorite. I use this creativity to spread love, spread peace from the depth of my soul into all the souls I can reach. I use this creativity to shine like the moon and the sun gave birth to me. I use these words to enlighten. I try to use these words in poems to make my life brighter, to make this life make sense, to give the world my two cents. See, I use this creativity to feed my family. Use these words to pay my rent, to strengthen bonds and improve friendships. I use this creativity to tighten my network. That's why I'm here. Said these words with so much conviction, my neck hurts. And if the words and my thoughts ever become things, I'll use this creativity to manifest a higher net worth. I use these words when my soul hurts. Use this creativity to soul search. I found out that passion and purpose were my motives. So I owe this poem to words and to creativity, because without them, I would not be alive. I use them both to survive, and without them, I would not know what peace is. And if you weren't here earlier, when I say peace and love, I just want to vibrate the frequency of peace and love through this space. So I need you to shout back love and peace. Peace and love. Love and peace. Peace and love. Love and peace. Peace and love. Love and peace. Happy World Peace Day. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we're gonna keep our hands together for Rachel Gleason. Real claps for Rachel Gleason. So one of the things that um, I often talk about when we go into schools and we're doing assemblies for young people um, in these auditoriums um, is I talk about uh, growing up in West Michigan. I did grow up in West Michigan um, in Hudsonville. Um, there are a lot of churches in West Michigan, as you know. A lot of these churches do amazing things for their communities um, and for the people that go to them. Uh, for me, my home life and my church environment was not the best place. It was extremely controlling and spiritually and emotionally abusive. Um, and one of the reasons I write today uh, is because I felt like I didn't have a voice for so long. Um, and if you, if you can see by looking at me, I'm just like a little bit gay. Uh, so, so that made things extra hard in the particular church that I was in. That was not an option. Um, but I tried really hard to be what other people wanted me to be, to say what other people wanted me to say, and to embody what other people wanted of me in my future. Um, but I got to the point where I was not able to do that anymore. I was struggling just to live and keep my head above water um, and felt so inauthentic and so lost until I finally found my own voice and I came out and I left the church and it was the hardest and scariest thing I've ever done, but it was also the best thing I've ever done. Um, I got engaged two weeks ago to an incredible human being and I'm very excited um, to start my, my, the future in my life with her. Um, but one of the reasons that I'm a writer today, and not just a writer, but someone who likes to speak and share my story um, at events like this, um, is it's so important to me that now I know who I am, I have my own voice, and I can live authentically and authentically loud and talk about the things that I do believe in. I don't believe in a lot of the things that the church taught me. I was taught a lot of judgment and condemnation, um, but I believe today that God is in everything, um, that there's beauty in everything, that there's poetry in everything. So this poem is about the things that I do believe in, uh, things I wasn't necessarily taught to see God in as a child, um, but I do now. I believe, I do believe, I believe, I do believe. I believe in pipe dreams, in clouds of blue-gray smoke with brilliant silver linings. I believe 
in scratch-off lottery tickets, in $2 cash words with big pots and impossible odds. I believe in those fleeting moments of ridiculous hope when you're worshiping the worn edge of that Susan B. Anthony coin, worshiping that friction and praying for the letter T because a T would change your life forever. I believe in hope for the sake of hoping. I believe in the God of instinct. I believe in the women locked up at Kent County, walking the perimeter of the big pod in groups of twos and threes, walking miles in circles, walking miles in circles that would stretch across state lines, for some of them to coastlines, if only they could walk outside. I believe in the God of small things in knock-knock jokes with X-rated punchlines, in well-weathered faces with deep grooves, crow's feet, and even deeper laugh lines. I believe in getting lost as a pastime and crisscrossing double-backed map lines. I believe in remembering the bad times, the being grateful for what we have times. I believe in Stonewall and the riots of 69 when the bull dykes and drag queens decided that their bar had been raided, that they'd been invaded and degraded for the last time, when the trans warriors whipped off their stilettos and wielded them against beat cops with billy clubs. I believe in the beauty of their thick muscles shifting and sliding beneath sequins and taffeta as they overturned high top tables sending smoking ashtrays and half drunk lipstick beer bottles flying. I believe in that constant relentless motion. That howl of refusal. I believe in resisting arrest when being arrested means being beaten and maimed and raped. I believe in the kind of rage that silences hate and the kind of pride that renounces shame. I believe in a God of many faces and of many names. I believe in the God of losers, of boozers, of mutts and of tramps and of wannabes. I believe in a God that says, try me. I believe in hopeless cases, in dead-end races. I believe in the God of possibility. I believe in myself. Yes. I believe in myself the way that children with bath towels tied around their necks believe they are heroes. I believe in myself the way that oil slicks and empty parking lots believe they are rainbows. I believe in the God of rationalization, of delirium and delusion. I believe in the God of certainty. I believe that nothing is certain. I believe in the God of contradiction. And this is the God that rules me. I believe in mutiny, in manipulating reality. I believe in belief for the sake of believing in exhaling clouds of blue-gray smoke with brilliant silver linings. I believe in pipe dreams. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please keep that going once again for Jocelyn Barnes. Hey, friends. So um, I'm a teaching artist with the diatribe. Uh, and our table's right here. We have a newsletter sign-up sheet. So if you guys want to give us your contact info, you can hear more from us, hear more about shows that we do in our community, because we are very community-based. Um, and this is a little something from me. Um, so this is more about finding inner peace. Um, I think that one of the most important parts about doing any work within any sort of capacity um, is starting within yourself first. Um, so this is uh, this is about uh, my relationship with my mom, and then also, like everything I write, my relationship with myself. The only thing that has more energy than a star is a dying one. Years after being kicked out of her home, I can still hear my mother's voice telling me that I need to lose weight, saying that I would find it easier to get the boys who make me cry myself to sleep want anything to do with me if I shed more pounds than tears. I can see her now, holding up photos of smaller versions of this body telling me how happy I look in those moments, these instances she's showing me, being the same stages of the death of a star, me, at 13, when I decided for the first time that being pretty is what got me assaulted at 15, when I came to the conclusion that food was the only constant in my life that made me feel good at 16, 
When my mother first showed me that there was no God in our flesh, that our blood was no thicker than water, that my fat cells were what kept her and I apart, so I created more and more distance between us, between the ages of 14 and 18. I went from a size 14 to 28. I doubled the size I took up on this earth in the face of post-traumatic stress that sought to diminish me. I ate myself back into existence when my abuser sought to take me out of it. I increased my gravitational pull when my disassociation had my head up in the clouds after the trial ended. My mother wished that I, the source of her insurmountable guilt, would disappear. So I thought to become a black hole, swallowing any hope she had, a salvation along with the house and home I'd eat her out of, but rather than caving in on myself and letting her words become my destiny, I exploded. Supernova'd my body into a new galaxy, my love becoming fresh light, my essence radiating in the stars surrounding me. The debris of my trauma rotates in my newfound gravity and I have become the center of my own universe, whole and peaceful and nothing you can mess with. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna do one last piece and I'm gonna send y'all away. Um, again, my name is Fable the Poet. You can find all of us on Instagram. If you guys have Instagram, if you guys have Facebook, you can look up Fable the Poet. You can look up Kid Kane. You can look up Jocelyn Barnes. You can look up Rachel Gleason. Uh, if you do wanna dive into all of us and who we are, or look up the diatribe too and you can find all of our information on there. Um, so I used to be somewhat of a ruffian. I, I didn't always used to be so community focused and, and try to be like such a catalyst for good. I used to be somewhat of a savage. Um, I used to just, uh, I grew up around a lot of liquor stores on every corner and seeing my family members cope with their stressors by diving into alcohol. So when I was growing up, I thought to myself like, what better way to solve your issues, especially when you're having a hard time, than do these things. And uh, a word from the not so wise, uh, don't do that. Uh, find healthier ways to do it. Uh, go see a therapist, uh, find a counselor, insert anything, physical activity, any of these things are better. But I tell you that to tell you this ruffian story. Uh, is there any of y'all out here who like stories? Do any of y'all like stories? Any of y'all like pay attention to Moth? Any of y'all watch Moth or, any, or listen to Moth? All right. Um, so about three years ago, um, I got this tape from my mom. I grew up uh, with an incredibly dynamic single mother, and she made a really unique choice to record the first five years of my life on the cassette tapes. She was like, I don't want you to regret any of the decisions that I made in your life. So she recorded everything from my first steps to my first words to all the fights that she got in with my biological father. And when I was 25 years old, uh, she started sending them to me every year for my birthday. So when I was 25, I went out to the mailbox, uh, eagerly awaiting like money, because that's what you want when you're 25. You're like hoping that it's a card of money. Uh, and when I got to the mailbox, I was just like, oh, what's this cassette tape? And how do I play it? So I had to like go to a family dollar and like get a cassette tape player. But when I put it in, I like heard her voice and I was like so blown away by hearing my mom's voice at the same age that I was. And every year, I proceeded to go out and like get really, really, really excited for these tapes that she would send me. Um, and three years ago, when I went out to that mailbox to go and get that cassette tape, there was an envelope with writing that I'd never seen before that I didn't recognize. And I, when I went to put in the cassette tape, it was a voice that I'd never heard. And it turns out that it was a tape from my biological dad. And he went on and on for like 30 to 40 minutes about why he couldn't ever be in my life, about why he chose to never be in my life. And it made me so mad. Um, and as you heard, I grew up in a pretty violent environment. So I thought, man, I want to break something. Um, and then I was like, no, it's my birthday. I'm going to drink about it. I'm going to turn up because it's my birthday. What else would you do on your birthday, right? Uh, so I went to Kalamazoo with a bunch of my friends, and they were like, don't worry. Have fun. We'll take care of you. And I was like, all right, bet. 
Uh, and then there was insert a uh, number of tequila shots. Don't make bad decisions like I've made in life. Um, and at the end of the night, they were like, oh, how are you getting home? And I was like, man, I don't know. And they're like, don't worry. We'll find you a designated driver. And I was like, bet. Great friends. Great friends. Um, so everybody's pulling out their phones, and they're looking for designated drivers. And one guy was like, don't worry. I got one. You're good. So the end of the night comes, and I'm like, all right, I'm ready to leave. And this guy's like, all right, hey, meet your designated driver. This is Paul. I say Paul because I don't want to throw his actual name under the bus. But I meet Paul, and Paul is like kind of twitchy, but he's like sober. So I'm like, all right, at the end of the day, what do I want on a designated driver list? Twitchy doesn't necessarily not make the list. So I was like, all right, that's fine. So I get in the car with Paul in his back seat, and he's driving back to Grand Rapids from Kalamazoo. And Paul sees this cop in the median, and he says, Bro, I'm not going back to prison and hits the gas. And when somebody says those words, bro, I'm not going back to prison and you are in their back seat, you immediately are like, this is a trash choice. Like I immediately regret this decision. Why did I make this decision? But and I, and as much as I'm thinking about this, the car is now moving so fast that you can like feel the momentum of the car moving. And I'm like hitting on the back of the seat like, Bro, you gotta you gotta slow down, bro. Bro, bro you got you gotta stop. And he's like, bro, I can't stop. And he's like flooring it, and like I see the blue and red lights behind me, and I'm like freaking out. I'm like, bro, you gotta stop, bro, 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 bro. And like looking at this guy, like me and you do not look the same. We have very different complexions. This is not going to end the same for both of us. I have a criminal history. You clearly have a criminal history. You gotta stop the vehicle. So he goes to like get off on the Gun Lake Casino exit, and he's like, I'm not gonna make, it, I'm not gonna make, it, I'm not gonna make it. Yanks the wheel blows it through the side rail and rolls it into the Gun Lake Casino parking lot. And I, I don't remember the next events that followed. I remember coming to and seeing dust and powder everywhere. I remember the airbags being out and the windows being shattered. And I remember the cops running up to the windows and they're like, get out the car, get out the car. But as I got yanked out of the car, I remember thinking to myself, like, this, this is what I do for a living. I travel all across the country. Two months ago, I got to speak at UCLA. I, I'm fortunate enough to, to make a living off of art and poetry and storytelling. And I remember thinking to myself, like, how did I get here? Not like, how did I get here in the sense of, like, when you wake up from a night of too many and you're like, how did I get here? But like, no, how did I actually get to this situation? And I remember thinking to myself, like, I go around talking about the importance of unpacking and bringing out the ugly and bringing out the embarrassing. And here I was unable to talk about what I was feeling from listening to these tapes. So this last poem that I'm gonna read uh, is my realization after listening to those. Is there anybody here who grew up in a single parent household, who grew up with a single parent, anybody? Um, this, this poem is to y'all and everybody else who struggled talking about something that feels uncomfortable. Yeah. So back in the day, when I was really, really young, I remember telling all the other kids at school that my dad was a superhero. And that he was just so busy saving everyone else to have any time for me. As I grew older, I'd refer to him as Santa Claus a man of folklore and unfathomable presence that only really came upon the mind once or twice a year when it's cold and you're entertaining the thought of warmth. Feeling a hole instead of mason jar with firefly, you see my empty spaces always let up when I am the darkest. Today, for what seems like the hundredth time, I listen to my biological father whisper me bittersweet nothings via cassette tape delivered in an envelope postmarked 1988. A symphony of not shits, can't do's, won't do's, should have's, and will never's. 20 glorious minutes of why he can't and won't ever be in my life. How thoughtful of him. He should have titled it, The Real Reason You Don't Have a Dad. Sit up with a kiss or his cologne, or some sweet lovey-dovey movie stuff instead of finding my, instead of forgetting my middle name on the outro. A wholehearted middle finger post sucker punch below the belt. You know what, let's throw in a Mike Tyson biting through my cartilage cheap shot metaphor in this part right here. Nah. We'll save the beautiful imagery and fancy wordplay for a poem not about him. Right. This isn't that poem. Right. This will not be his poem. I will not give him something to be proud of. Why do you think I used to live my life like that? Two parts self-abuse, seven parts fearful of success, one part neglect, no part self-love though. I wasn't gonna pick up where he decided to leave off. I will leave it there. 
on the shelf with the cape that he never chose to wear in the closet with the other childish fantasies two years ago. I thought I saw a god from the back seat of Alexis Coop. He looked like a coked out felon. He smelled like fear and recovery. He chose to total the car going nearly 100 miles an hour and made me realize that I am only a human. He had my life in his hands, opposed to my existence, disregarded he had a soul in the back seat, trying to turn a fable to an anecdote. I climbed out of the total car, kissing the ground the way the police like us to us. Black, thank you, Dad, I appreciate this gift, but my life keeps spiraling out of control. I bet he's proud. I am now a hurricane of heartbreak and the ugly stuff. What am I doing here? How did I get here? So I used to ask myself so many nights, mouth tasting like, well, something, because while well, I had to use something to make myself feel better before I used someone, but I know that I get that from him. I always rewind and play back the part where he talks about his love life. He says, son, my son, I've never been any good at relationships. You can ask your mother this one day, but I never asked her. I never wanted to know, but you know what's the worst part? Is that he ended his cassette tape with a poem. Before he even knew who I'd become, he ended it with a poem for months. I hated poetry. I would hear him speak at open mic nights and out of my students' mouths. I watched him turn my safe haven into a battleground of self-discovery. I fell into my vices hoping I would land in them and not wake up to just another day of picking up pieces of myself. But back in the day, when I was really, really young, I remember not being broken. I am now working to find that boy again, and when I do, I will shower him in comic books and cartoons. I will tell him not to look for his father here. I will tell him that if he gives his all to his community, if he inspires somebody, then one day he might actually become a hero. At least to somebody. Thank you all very, very, very much. My name is Fable the Poet. We are the Diatribe. Happy, happy, happy World Peace Day. Thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, can y'all make some noise for GRCC real quick? Make some noise for GRCC uh, for putting this incredible event together. Please come see us. Take away all our CDs and all of our stickers and all of our goodies and sign up for an email list. November 22nd, Rudy Francisco. Now I'm just rambling. Here's Cheval. Promoted it. Yes. This, yes. All good. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Love you. All. The United Nations theme for this year is World Peace Day, climate change, and how it affects us all. So please give us a warm welcome for Professor Mary on the CERT. Well, thanks, Sean. How's the volume out there? Good? Okay. Well, first, I want to thank our GRCC Peace Day organizers for putting on this event. Yeah, yeah. And for inviting me to speak um, on the relationship between climate action and peace. I was just talking to creative writing students this morning about one of the difficulties in writing is trying to do an idea justice especially when it's so full in our mind and our heart, and then all we have are words to express it. But I'm gonna give it my best shot. So you're gonna hear a few international references, but I'm gonna approach this challenge through the lens of American environmental activism with a few examples from close to home. The title of my talk, Climate Action, Peace, and the four E's of sustainability. Has peace, has peace spelled with four E's. So it goes P-E-E-E-E, -E -E -E, Peace Day, 2019. My spelling is a nod to author and activist Bill McKibben, who in 1989 wrote a book titled The End of Nature. Of course, McKibben was hoping nature didn't end, he tried to capture for us the concept that the natural world has intrinsic value, that the earth has a type of wisdom called ecology, and we need to place earth and environment at the top of our thoughts. Then, in 2010, McKibben wrote a book titled Earth, 
with Earth spelled with two A's, E-A-A-R-T-H, to denote his subtitle, Making a Life on a Tough New Planet. Because unfortunately, our science tells us that we haven't done enough yet to prevent or mitigate the effects of climate change. Earth was a book about math, about scientific models and calculations regarding carbon in the atmosphere. It was about sea level rise, glaciers melting, the loss of species. But this is where you come in. Earth was also a book about human behavior. The one variable when it comes to climate action that is highly unpredictable. Earth was bleak in its warnings, but McKibben hasn't given up. In 2008, he and several college students in Vermont organized a national climate action effort called 350.org to bring awareness to our need to keep carbon dioxide in our atmosphere at or below 350 parts per million. Well, in 2019, and you can look this up on a data site called co2.earth, our atmospheric carbon levels are holding in the low 400s. We've already surpassed 350. But McKibben and other climate activists are still not giving up. Instead, McKibben has become a spokesperson for a national effort on college campuses across the country to divest from the fossil fuel industry and to invest in more green and sustainable energies. Bill McKibben's life work and the work of a lot of activists working toward environment and social justice models the three E's of sustainability. So first, E for environment reminds us of ecology and interdependence. Just a few inches below our feet here on Bostwick Commons, a living, breathing world exists and we are a part of it. E for equity brings questions such as how are we as a society making sure that all in our communities have equal access to education, health care, clean air, clean water. E for economy asks, do our economic systems welcome participation? Are we making and distributing products with sustainability in mind? Do our jobs offer livable wages and a fair and balanced distribution of the wealth created by our work? And when it comes to climate action, this year's focus for International Peace Day, there's another critically important E in our quest for sustainability. The fourth E in P-E-E-E-E -E 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 Peace Day is energy. Because when it comes to climate action, how we power our communities is critical. Environmental and social ju justice activists tell us that for far too long, our treatment of the environment and each other has suffered due to an approach that puts economy and energy first. Because in a sustainability sense, Systems that prioritize any of these E's at the expense of others are systems that create injustice. This year, as a part of a 17-goal plan for sustainability, the United Nations has designated 2019 as the year of climate action. In other words, it's time for environment and equity to be top priorities. It's time for action that makes our places better for all. Now, action is a word that can be overwhelming, can be downright scary. In fact, it makes us feel inadequate when the call to act comes in. But the good news is there are unlimited ways to address climate action and peace by honoring, each in our own way, these all-important E's. I want to share with you for a moment some of my awareness-making mentors when it comes to writers for action and peace. First, I'm thankful for the Native American authors such as N. Scott Mamaday and Linda Hogan for reminding me always that we humans are a part of our environment. In the 1850s, Henry David Thoreau went into the woods 
two miles outside of town, and build a cabin on Walden Pond, where he lived for over two years. He wrote about our human relationship with nature, but he also wrote about war, our treatment of Native Americans, burgeoning new technologies that he feared would flatten our communications. And in his famous speech on civil disobedience, Thoreau charged us all with the responsibility to act when our society is unjust. The most important thing he may have showed us is that by going to the edge of his own society, he was able to see certain truths, that voices from the margins are crucial to justice and peace. Thoreau didn't invent civil disobedience, but he helped to frame this tool for abolitionists, for leaders in the women's movement, for Mahatma Gandhi, for Martin Luther King Jr., for activists to our day. A hundred years later, Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring. In the heyday of the petrochemical era, she wrote with a combination of poetry and science to inform us how pesticides and neurotoxins like DDT, DDT were affecting plants, animals, humans, all of us. She insisted at a sci as a scientist that the public must know. In the 1960s, a Midwesterner named Aldo Leopold gave us titles like Thinking Like a Mountain and definitions like Our Biotic Community to help us picture ourselves as a part of our places. And he theorized that we were on a necessary path towards social, ecological evolution. Hmm. Social ecological evolution. Ecology celebrates edges and diversity as places of great growth. Humans, it seems, have a great deal to learn from Earth and the principles of ecology. Finally, Kathleen Dean Moore, a philosopher who has been a guest here on our GRCC campus, has a wonderful phrase called the ecology of love. She says that we are all capable of great action when we recognize our connection to each other and our places, when we commit to activism with reverence. Which brings me to the intersection between activism and peace. Working toward justice and peace is a form of reverence, right? When we think of peace, we imagine our most creative, compassionate, inclusive communities. We shape in our minds a future based on love and unity, a better future. But how, you might ask, can we envision a better future when glaciers are melting, sea levels are rising, when we're experiencing more powerful storms, more devastating floods, more vast and frequent forest fires, when we are losing biodiversity daily? And here in Michigan, last January, we felt the rush of Arctic air come sweeping down toward us like a climate dam breaking and we shook our heads at the polar vortex when classes were canceled. Believe me, there are times when I ask myself, what on earth can my act of writing do to help in the face of these challenges? And when in doubt, I try to remember an incredible story of indigenous wisdom. In 2009, I heard a poet from the Black Earth Institute, Richard Cambridge, Talk about a trip to Greenland. He went to Greenland to learn from indigenous tribal leaders to see how their language and their songs and their poetry might be changing in response to their changing climate. Apparently, in the native languages of Greenland, there are thousands of words to describe weather because the people live so closely to their natural environments. But the tribal leaders had literally run out of words. So elders across the country assembled for a meeting to create new words to explain the weather changes and the glacial melting. And the overarching word they came up with, Cambridge told us, translates into English as a familiar old friend behaving strangely. Can you hear that? 
In the language, there is activism with reverence. The language it ca itself calls for a deep, reverent listening. In fact, you may say any of us transformed by the desire to act could become a familiar old friend behaving strangely. Change isn't predictable. Change certainly isn't orderly. Change is messy. Change changes. I guess my point is, our action doesn't have to be clear or precise. Any activism with reverence will do. What do you love? When you envision a just and a peaceful future, what does a healthy, peaceful environment look like to you? We've seen what happens when environment and equity are left in last place, or worse, all out ignored. When the four E's get terribly out of balance, we see situations like the Flint water crisis, a completely avoidable, human-made crisis based on, for the sake of quick phrasing, a state policy that allows financially troubled communities to be managed by a financial manager. Under emergency financial management, communities lose their local voice. They lose the ability to make decisions that affect environment and equity. For the people of Flint, E for economy prevailed, and they lost what the UN recognizes as a basic human right, the right to clean, fresh drinking water. Earlier in this decade, Michigan experienced one of the most devastating inland oil spills in U.S. history when over a million gallons of tar sands bitumen, sticky pre-oil substance that is nearly impossible to clean up, spilled into Talmadge Creek and made its way to the Kalamazoo River. As a writer, as an observer, I wrote about activists who stood up to resist further pipeline expansions. When three and four and five years later, Enbridge, the international company building the pipeline, had still not cleaned up the Kalamazoo River. In fact, the river will never be the same. Michigan's Enbridge Five, as those five activists were called, were raised into tripods to protest the expansion of new tar sands pipelines into Michigan state forests. They locked down to bulldozers on the site of homeowners who were protesting the doctrine of eminent domain as new pipelines pushed through their yards. None of these activists were able to stop pipelines from running under rivers or through forests and yards, but that wasn't their goal. Their goal was to give us, the public, a chance to see the damage done when we cling to old systems. They acted on behalf of earth and climate, hoping a busy public would understand the urgency to move to greener, more sustainable energies, which we are absolutely capable of producing. They acted, and so can we. So must we. It's important to note that seeing the end of the fossil fuel era does not mean climate action diminishes the contributions of the people who work in the oil and gas industry. The U.S. has enjoyed many economic boom years thanks to cheap oil and gas, thanks to the hard work of wildcatters and roughnecks and engineers and computer programmers. But as oil and gas industry geologists and clim climate scientists alike will tell us, oil and gas are no longer cheap and easy to get at. From boiling bitumen in gooey toxic pits to fracturing the bedrock to release shale oil and gas, we know that greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise and extraction becomes more and more destructive. So it's time on behalf of climate action to rebalance those ease. Our college president, Dr. Bill Pink, used the term disruption in our opening meeting this fall. Disruption as a step toward change. And I think a D for disruption fits in my ease toward climate action. Because science and our recent experiences tell us that we need swift, 
bold action, united action, to address climate change. We don't all have to get raised in a tripod. We don't all have to lock down to a bulldozer along the tar sands pipeline path. But we should understand and appreciate the role of direct action, of nonviolent civil disobedience in disrupting a system out of balance. There is great opportunity to act, to, dis to disrupt in a positive sense by attending to our ease, each in our own way. Let's start by relearning from Earth. We know, thanks to the natural sciences and indigenous wisdom, that trees communicate through their root systems. Older trees direct water and other nutrients toward the most vulnerable and youthful trees in the community because in the simplest ecological terms, the health of one is the health of all. What can we do then to recognize our interdependence with our environment, to encourage and protect diversity, to create compassionate, resilient local communities? because this is where we are needed most when it comes to climate action. We need to create compassionate, inclusive, resilient communities. Equity invites action from every interest in occupation. So what can you do, future nurses, doctors, researchers, to, insurance that patients, to ensure that patients just up the hill from us are listened to with the most open, equitable, receptive ears. And of course, the link between energy and climate is clear. As students and activists at 350.org have been illustrating for years, if we are to slow the effects of climate change, we must transition as fast as possible away from fossil fuel extraction. Here at GRCC, we've been training wind technicians for years. In fact, one activist who went up in that tripod, tripod I mentioned a few minutes ago was a former GRCC student. And she spent 30 days in jail for her role in disrupting construction of a new tar sands pipeline project for one nine to five work day. And then she completed a wind tech program and now she's climbing turbines. Many of you will design, promote, and install new green technologies. Some of you will draft green building project and develop green communities. And finally, economy. Those of you in business and marketing, in economics and public policy, what will you do to ensure that our economic plans work toward justice and peace? How can we support the most innovative, sometimes marginal, new ideas? We don't always know exactly what our role will be in something as huge as climate action. But when you are guided by your passions, when we act for what we love, activism with reverence is activism toward peace. And you've got a lot of E's to choose from on this P-E-E-E-E -E 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 Peace Day 2019. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your peace day.